Hello and welcome to Kaboom Marine Aquarium's Discovery Lecture Series. I am Dr. Julianne Passarelli, the Education and Collections Curator at Kaboom Marine Aquarium. I'll start with just some information for the viewers. This is a webinar style platform, so you cannot see yourself nor can you mute or unmute yourself. But any questions you have, please put them in the Q&A feature. Typically it's at the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the lecture. We will also be monitoring the chat. Please use the chat feature for any specific questions about the aquarium or anything general about the, about the lecture series, but all questions for our speaker can go into the Q&A and we'll be able to monitor, monitor which questions get answered um, easier through the Q&A. Kaboom and Aquarium is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks, and we are extremely grateful for the city's support. I would also like to thank the Aquarium Director, Kristen McCarran, and Programs Director, Jim DePompe, for the support, and a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. I am happy to report that the Aquarium is now open. After being closed for 15 months, we are super happy to welcome you all back. Our hours of operation are Wednesdays through Sunday from noon to five. We have some upcoming programs I would like to share with you. We are now resuming our monthly beach cleanups on the first Saturday of every month. The next one is tomorrow, October 2nd at 9 a.m. We also have a public fish dissection this weekend on Sunday, October 3rd where you can get a closer look at the outside and the inside of a fish. And Sea Scare is back. On Saturday, October 23rd, help us celebrate the 15th year of our family-friendly Halloween event with the Haunted Port Town theme that includes all of your favorites, games, take-home crafts, haunted maze, skull alley, costume contest, and trunk or treat. For more details, you can visit our website at kaboomerinaquarium.org. Before we get started, I would also like to thank and acknowledge the friends of Cabrillo Marine Aquarium for their support. We would also like to thank all of the members of the aquarium. Being a member is a great way to support our aquarium while receiving special member-only benefits. Your friends' membership helps support the aquarium's quality education, research, and outreach programs. If you'd like to become a member, visit our website for details or stop by the aquarium's welcome booth. For at least one more lecture, we plan to continue this series online. The upcoming lecture is on Friday, December 3rd, and our speaker is Dr. Mara Hart from Ocean Inc. The title of her talk is Sex in the Sea, The Weird and Wonderful Ways Animals Reproduce in the Ocean and why that matters. I hope you can join us for this online lecture. After that, the next lecture will be on Friday, February 4th, 2022. And we are really hoping that the February lecture will be back in person at the aquarium. The upcoming schedule for speakers for 2022 will be posted on our website. There's a link on the homepage under new splash called Discovery Lecture Series and that will take you to the upcoming schedule. If you missed any lectures, they were all recorded and all are archived on our website on the Discovery Lecture Series page. Just scroll down to Lecture Archives 2014 to 2021, or you can go to the CMA YouTube page. If you're interested in the upcoming lecture in December, please RSVP to receive the webinar link like you did tonight, because yes, again, the December lecture will be online. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Yanni Papastamatiu. Dr. Papastamatiu is an assistant professor at Florida International University, where he runs the Predator Ecology and Conservation Lab. He and his students study the behavior and physiological ecology of marine predators and use this information for conservation. His research takes place all over the world, including Florida, Bahamas, Belize, Alaska, Japan, Mexico, the Galapagos, and the islands and atolls of the Central Pacific. He has published over 90 scientific papers and his work has been featured on National Geographic, BBC, Discovery Channel, CNN, 
and in the New York Times. The title of tonight's talk is The Secret Social Lives of Sharks. Thank you, and we welcome Dr. Yanni Papastamatiu. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining me uh, this evening. And what I'd like to do is hopefully try to get you to see sharks in a slightly different light. And that is seeing them as social animals. Now, when I use the term social animals, what exactly do I mean? What is the definition of a social animal? Well, in this case, we'll consider it animals that like to hang out with other individuals, which means you can see them as groups. And so we can see examples of this across the animal kingdom, from schools of fishes to herds of elephants, prides of lions, flocks of birds. Those would all be uh, examples of animals that form social groups. And again, we can see that from everywhere, from insects up to mammals. But traditionally, it's not something that we view sharks as being. We've never really considered them as being social animals. Now, before I discuss some reasons why you might see sociality in sharks and look for evidence if they are social, I want to introduce a few aspects of their biology, which might, again, get you to think of them in a slightly different light. First of all, we know that sharks can learn. Now that by itself may not be surprising. All animals will probably have some degree of learning, but their learning capabilities can be quite impressive. So back in the 60s, Eugenie Clark, who you can see in the picture on the left here, um, did some famous experiments where she was actually able to train lemon sharks to associate hitting a target with getting fed. So they were able to learn fairly complex tasks. And obviously it took them a little while to train and learn that task, but nonetheless, they may have cognitive abilities, which are somewhat better than you might give them credit for. And more recently, we've actually been able to see that they can actually learn from watching others. So some colleagues of mine performed somewhat similar experiments with, uh, again, baby lemon sharks in the Bahamas, where in a similar setup, they would train sharks to associate hitting a target with getting a food reward. And so they had certain sharks which were experienced, meaning they had been trained already. But what they then did was they introduced a naive shark into this setup. So this is a shark that had never been trained, and they looked to see how quickly that naive individual learned that task. And what they found was that a shark that was sharing a tank with an experienced individual learned that task much more quickly than if it had been by itself. And the only way we can really explain that is that the sharks were able to learn by watching others. They were able to learn that task from observing what those other sharks that were already trained knew what to do. So we would call this social learning, where you learn a task by, again, observing another individual. And again, the ability for social learning does not in itself mean you're going to be social, but again, it shows that their cognitive abilities may be somewhat better than you might give them credit for. We also know that sharks are capable of body language. So back in the 70s in the Marshall Islands and the Pacific Ocean, several underwater photographers were getting bitten by this species here, the gray reef shark. And just before they got bitten, they noticed that the sharks were behaving somewhat strangely. They would drop their pectoral fins, arch their back, and they'd swim in this somewhat spiral manner. Now, this was a, an interesting observation and no one really knew why they were doing this behavior or what its significance was to the divers who ended up getting bit. So Don Nelson, who at the time was a professor at Cal State Long Beach, quite close to uh, where the aquarium is, started a study and he and his students basically went out to the Marshall Islands and what they did was they would essentially charge these sharks under different scenarios. So they had some sharks that were in open ocean, some sharks that had their backs to the reef and they would swim towards them and try and see if they would be aggressive towards them. Now, this was before universities had sort of the strict safe, uh, safety standards we have now, but they quickly realized that this was somewhat risky. So what Don did was he actually built his own submersible, what he called the shark observation submersible, which you can see here. And so now he could approach those sharks and obviously he was safe. And indeed the sharks did often uh, attack and bite the sub. But what he found was that the sharks were much more likely to do that display and then bite the sub if they were having their backs up against the reef. If they had plenty of room to move, plenty of room to escape, they were a lot less likely to do it. And so what this most likely was, was a display from the shark that it was feeling threatened. And they were biting the divers, not because they wanted to eat them, but because they were feeling threatened and trying to defend themselves. So the body language was likely a signal as a warning to tell them to back off, to tell the diver that they were feeling threatened and they needed to back off. Obviously the divers didn't understand what that meant at the time, and so they were getting bitten. Now you may wonder why a shark would bother giving a warning before striking a, a diver. 
And it's important to remember that a diver is a big animal. We are big animals. I mean, a gray reef shark is, you know, probably smaller than an adult human. And so that sort of interaction could turn out badly for the shark. So we'd rather not do it. And that's why it would provide this warning. But again, this means that we know that sharks can use body language, in this case, between sharks and humans, but also potentially they could be using body language amongst themselves as well. So the next question is, why would sharks form social groups? What is the advantage of being social? First of all, I should point out that there's many species of animals that are not social, they're solitary. And there's disadvantages to being in a group. For one thing, if there's more of you, then you're going to have more competition for resources, such as food or mates. So it's not always an advantage to be in a group. But what can the advantages be? And how may that relate to the biology of sharks? So one obvious area may be related to hunting. So anytime you see animals hunting as a group, we'll call that social foraging. But within social foraging, you can have several different categories. And the most advanced one, is what we call cooperative hunting. And this is where individuals in the group actually take on specific roles and they work together. So this is something you would see, for example, with orcas when they try to take out a seal sitting on a piece of ice or lions taking, off, uh, taking out a, a large animal. We have very little evidence of cooperative hunting in sharks. One of the few cases which could well be cooperative hunting was some observations made off of Namibia with seven gill sharks. Now, these observations were made in the 80s, so there was no pictures available, so we have these sketches instead. But what was, a, what was observed is that these seven gill sh uh, sharks essentially circled the first seal that they saw, but they didn't all charge in. They just formed this ring around the animal. And the first seal is a very agile animal. It's a difficult prey to take down. So the sharks formed this ring, and they basically boxed in the seal, and they made that ring smaller and smaller and smaller until the seal had nowhere to go, and then they struck. So the way this behavior took place does suggest that potentially these individual animals, these sharks were actually cooperating. They were taking on roles, taking on certain jobs in order to get this large meal, presumably because it'd be very difficult for a single shark to take out one of these fur seals. But to the best of my knowledge, this is really the only good example we have or decent example we have of true cooperation. But social foraging can be much simpler than just requiring cooperation. It doesn't have to be that complex. So what I'm going to show you next is some video footage taken from Fakaraba Channel. It's in French Polynesia. I shot this footage at night. These are gray reef sharks. You have about 300 gray reef sharks here. And they're naturally hunting. There's no bait in the water. They're hunting reef fish in the reef. So in a moment, you'll see all the sharks start to head towards the left of the uh, screen. And you can see how now they're all polarized. They're all going in the same direction. Now, I'm going to look down. And when I look up, everyone's going to shoot towards the right. And what actually happened here is that one shark went for a reef fish. That reef fish startled. Another shark went for that reef fish. Another shark saw the shark that went for the reef fish. Another shark saw the shark, saw the shark and so on. So what you're seeing here is that there is sharing of information. And in this case, the information is the presence or the location of prey. I don't mean that the sharks are purposefully sharing information. It's inadvertent. But it's advantageous nonetheless, because it's much easier to see another shark going for fish or prey than it is to see the prey themselves. And over time, this could end up being beneficial for everybody. So this could drive the evolution of having a social group. It doesn't necessarily require complex cooperation. And the nice thing about this is it could even drive associations or perhaps animals of different species hanging around each other. So this footage is also from Fakaraba, and in the center of the screen, you can see a white tip reef shark sticking into the coral. And what's happened here is that the white tip went into the coral and it's chased out a reef fish. The reef fish is trying to escape, and you can see it going up to the water column, and you have this beautiful volcano of gray reef sharks. So white tips have an advantage over gray reefs. They can actually get inside the coral because they don't always have to swim, unlike gray reef sharks, which can never stop swimming. So they can go places gray reefs can't go. And so what we found was that when gray reefs hunt next to white tip reef sharks, their foraging success goes up by 20%. And that's because they can take advantage of the white tips behavior. Now, this isn't advantageous for the white tips. They actually end up losing prey sometimes, not all the time. So you may wonder, well, what does the white tips want to hunt with the gray reef sharks? We don't really have much of a choice. Um, they're vastly outnumbered and there's nowhere really for them to go. 
Now, there's lots of food in this channel, so presumably it's still better for them to forage in the channel than to leave it. But a consequence of that is that they have some of their prey stolen by grey reefs. But nonetheless, you can see some of the advantages of animals associating with each other. So hunting can be one driver of shark social groupings. Another one could be related to mating. And sharks have, again, quite complex mating habits because sharks don't mate like other fishes. Most fishes use external fertilization where they release sperm and eggs into the water column. Sharks mate more like mammals. They have internal fertilization. So here you can see two white tip reef sharks that were seen mating off of Cocos Island in Costa Rica. And uh, the male shark has essentially bitten the female's pectoral fin so he can turn around on the back and he's inserted one of his claspers into the cloaca. And the clasper is basically like a modified fin. So this is the mating process. But perhaps what is more important from a shark's social system is what happens just before mating. So this is some footage I shot off of uh, Roca Platida, which is a small rock off the coast of Mexico, part of Socorro Islands. And here you can see, again, these are all white tip reef sharks. And so you have what we call sort of pre-mating display from these sharks. Now, you can't see the exact sex of the individuals in this video, but almost certainly just one or two of them are females and the rest of them are males. And we see this similar behavior, it's quite similar even between different species, where you have multiple males following these females trying to mate with them. But what is of interest to us going to the future is trying to understand if the females are selecting which males to mate with. Because for the females, the baby shark will develop in the uterus. So she has to invest a lot of energy into producing that young. And from an evolutionary standpoint, we would expect her to select the best male, the male with the best gene. And we still know very little about how female sharks select mates, if indeed they do. And how about they choose them? How do you pick which male has the best genes and is the best one to make? But again, if you just by looking at this video, so the complexity that goes into the sort of pre-mating ritual that we see within the animals. And perhaps related to the mating process, not necessarily confirmed, is what I consider one of the most spectacular uh, sites in the shark world, if not in the animal kingdom. And that relates to seeing schools of scallop hammerhead sharks. So, this is footage I shot last year off of Wolf Island in the Galapagos. And you can go out to Wolf at the right time of year and see scallop hammerhead sharks in the hundreds, there's potentially a thousand animals. It truly is one of the most spectacular sites I've ever seen. And yet we still know very little about why these sharks form these huge aggregations. And you can find aggregations of the hammerheads of a few different places, Galapagos, uh, Cocos Island off of Costa Rica, Malpelo off of Colombia, the coral islands of New Mexico, the seamounts of Baja of Mexico was one of the original study sites for scout hammerhead sharks, although sadly there's far fewer of them, of them there today because they've been overfished. So when the study was done off of the seamounts of Baja, done by a scientist called Pete Klimley, um, who was at UC Davis at the time, um, what he noticed was that the schools were mostly made out of female sharks. And he also noticed that the largest females were in the center of the school and they would actually exclude the smaller ones to the periphery of the school. It actually physically uh, sort of pushed the other ones, the smaller females to the periphery. Now, he also saw that when males would come to the school, that they seemed to be heading towards the center. So he hypothesized that perhaps this is a mating system where being in the center is the best place to be if you're a female in terms of males coming to find you to mate with. Now, subsequently, we haven't really seen the similar sort of behaviors at places like Galapagos or Cocos. So I don't know if that's true for all locations or how widespread that is. So I would leave it with saying that we still know very little about the systems of these sharks. Except there's obviously interesting stuff going on. So if you look, this is also from Wolf Island. You'll see at the top of the screen, a shark that starts to do a little dance. It's starting to do a shimmy and dancing around for some reason. And that startles the shark behind it. So we think, see things like this. We see these sort of strange behaviors by sharks when they're within the group. And that for whatever reason, that then transmits to other individuals behind them. But we don't really know why that is. We don't know whether that's just the shark being weird for some reason, if it's some body language, we really don't know. 
So despite this being one of the largest and the most spectacular examples of, of shark social groups or shark grouping behavior, we understand very little about its function. And so again, I put forward this, this idea with a question mark because this has been proposed and it was seen based on work done of one location of Mexico, but I don't know whether this is a good explanation for hammerhead aggregations in all areas. It might be true for Mexico and then not necessarily for other aggregations. So one other reason for being in a group is defense. So if you're in a group, you're more likely to see approaching predators. You have more eyes, so to speak. You'll also have an advantage because if you're in a group, there's a smaller probability that you will get targeted by the predator. So if there's 100 of you, you're less likely to be the unlucky individual that actually gets targeted by an approaching predator, what we call a dilution effect. And that can be another reason for driving the formation of animal groups. And you might think of sharks as being top predators at the top of the food chain, but we know that that's only true for a few species, maybe white sharks, tigers, bull sharks, but for most species, that's not true. They're going to be probably somewhere in the middle towards the upper part of the food chain, but they will still have predators. So this pretty amazing uh, pictures you see here was off of Rangiro, I believe, in French Polynesia, where a great hammerhead came and grabbed an adult gray reef shark from an aggregation of gray reefs. And so great hammerheads are well-known shark killers. They have several different species of sharks, which they will hunt and kill. So again, this shows that sharks do have predators. And this is something that we see every year off of Florida, especially South Florida, because each spring we see a migration of tens of thousands, sometimes black tip sharks, which are migrating from up north. And black tip sharks are something that great hammerheads like to eat. And so we can see this right off the beaches off of West Palm Beach and Jupiter, for example. So here's some drone footage and that big shark you see is a great hammerhead and all those small ones are black tips. Now they're not that small, those are probably going to be four or five feet, or perhaps four feet long, but here you can see a great hammerhead chasing a black tip, and as that black tip starts to run away, the other black tips will also start to startle and they'll also make a run for it. So in this case, the group of black tips is still sharing information, but this time the information isn't the location of prey, it's that a predator is approaching. So some of those black tips that you saw flee um, did not actually see the hammerhead themselves. They just saw one of their buddies running for it and figured out there was something bad and they ran for it as well. So again, in that way, it could be advantageous to be in a group because of that rapid transmission of information. And again, in this case, information is there's a predator approaching. And again, just to point out that this sharing information doesn't have to be on purpose. I'm not trying to say one shark is advertising on purpose to the others. It's inadvertent. If you run for it, another shark sees you running for it, it can figure out that you're running because something's chasing you and therefore it's going to run itself. Now, one final explanation I'll give for grouping and not to say these are the only explanations, there are other ones as well. These are just the main ones that I came up with. And that is related to the hydrodynamic advantage of swimming in a group. And that is that it can be energetically more efficient to swim in a group versus swimming by yourself. And a good way to think about this is by looking at what we see with birds. Now, obviously, we're not talking about hydrodynamics, we're talking about aerodynamics, but many of you will have seen this uh, V formation that I show in this picture here, which is how birds will often fly as a flock. And the reason they do that is because the birds at the front change the aerodynamic patterns for those birds behind them and actually makes it more efficient for those birds behind to fly versus if they were flying by themselves. So that you can expend less energy. Now, you may wonder why the birds at the front do this, because they're not getting any benefit because they're at the front. And the answer to that is that they will switch positions. So the individual at the front will switch with other individuals in the back so that everybody can take advantage of this. And we may see something similar in sharks as well. We know from studies with smaller fish, for example, that there's an advantage to being swimming in a group. Those fish at the front generate vortices, and those individuals behind them can use those to actually reduce how much energy they spend to swim. And again, you'll see the fish switch positions in the group so that those in the front can also go to the back where they can take advantage of this. And really recent data, some of my colleagues have gathered off of Florida, for example, has shown that some sharks swimming in a group swim, seem to be swimming with less effort than those that swim by themselves. So these are all potential explanations for 
uh, reasons why sharks may form social groups. But do we actually see evidence of sociality, sharks actually choosing to spend time with other individuals in the wild? And this is kind of tricky to do because you have to show that your animals are spending time with other individuals and spending more time with those individuals than you predict by chance alone. And hopefully this picture will explain why it can be quite tricky to determine if there is true sociality. So again, this is from Rocca Partida, the slide, I, the video I showed you with the white tip reef sharks. And Rocca Partida is a rock in the middle of the ocean. It's a sheer drop on all sides going down to 300 feet. And it will take you about 15 minutes to swim around the rock. And there's nothing else. It's just open ocean. Yet you have lots of white tip reef sharks. Now, white tips need to lie down at times. They don't swim continuously. So they need somewhere to lie. Now, on a coral reef, that's not a problem. They just lie on the reef. But in Rocca Partida, they don't have much room to lie on. All they have are these ledges. So I took this picture and you can see these white tips lying down on the ledge close to each other. And one explanation is that these sharks are choosing to be close to each other because they're social. For whatever reason, they're forming a group and they're choosing to be close to each other. But another explanation could be they're only close to each other because there's not that much ledge for them to lie on. So it's got nothing to do with them being social. It's just that they want to find somewhere to sit and they have to sit next to each other. So in this case, it's the, or it could be the features of the habitat, not the animals necessarily trying to be social and spend time with each other. So when we're studying social systems in the wild, we have to try and tease those two apart. So how do we measure social structure of animals in the wild? How do we first of all tell if they are forming social groups? And when I describe this, I like to give the analogy of humans, and so under normal times, let's imagine that I'm giving this lecture in an auditorium. You're all sitting in the auditorium and you're likely to be sitting next to your friends or family. So although everybody is in one room, there's social structure within that room. There's going to be social groups, groups of you who know each other. And then also there'll be plenty of people in the room that you don't know, even though you may be within close proximity to those individuals. So there would be social structure there. So how could I describe or study the social structure of all of you in the room? Well, the best way for me to do it would be to go around and interview you all and ask you, do you know this person? And I could even ask you, do you like this person? And how much do you like this person? And then I can directly get that information about how well you know this other individual, if you know them at all. But obviously that can be kind of tricky. So a simpler way for me to measure social associations is to see how much time you spend with other individuals. Because if I was to follow you around and how much time you spent with other individuals, presumably you're gonna spend more time with those individuals you're close to. So for example, family members or friends, you'll spend more time. You may spend some time within proximity to a stranger, not because you know that person, but just by chance, you spend some time next to them. Maybe you, go, uh, you both go to Starbucks at the same time, you don't know that person, but you're just there because of the Starbucks, but you still spend a little bit of time. So I would do that for every pair of you in the room. And then I could put this into a mathematical uh, algorithm, a technique we call social network analysis, and it will produce something that looks like this, what we call a social network diagram. So if you imagine with a figure like this, every circle represents an individual, for example, one of you in the room. And what this does is based on all that data I put in, it clumps those individuals that really spend a lot of time with each other, those that are social groups. And the beauty of this tool is you can just look at it and see if there's social structure coming out. So here you can see, for example, there's a red group, individuals that all spend a lot of time with each other, know each other for use of a better word. There's a blue group, those individuals all know each other. You can see most individuals from the red group don't know individuals from the blue group. There's a yellow group, there's a purple group and so on. So the lines between the circles show you that those individuals have some level of association. It doesn't necessarily have to be a strong association, but they will have some association. But the key with this network analysis is it clumps together those individuals that form social groups, if there are indeed any social groups. So the nice thing about this is, again, you can tell is there sociality here, but it also can be useful for other reasons. For example, it lets us know how information can spread throughout the uh, animal groups. So for example, I'll go back to my analogy of we're in the auditorium, you're all in the room. 
Now, let's say I do a social network analysis and I find out that half of you on one side of the room know each other, you're all friends. Half of you on the other side of the room know each other, you're all friends. But there's not one person who knows both sides of the room. So let's say I go to the right side of the room and I start to spread a rumor. That rumor will spread throughout the group on the right because everybody knows each other. But it won't go to the group on the left because nobody on the right knows anybody on the left. and They're not going to tell them that rumor. If, on the other hand, there's just a couple of individuals that know people from both groups, and now that rumor will spread throughout the room. So based on the social network analysis, I can predict how that rumor will spread. Now, obviously, sharks aren't spreading rumors, but they are other forms of information, such as the location of prey, which can spread. And the network helps us understand that. So I'm going to give you three examples of social networks of sharks from the wild. And the first one was done by a colleague of mine in Morea, French Polynesia, with black tip reef sharks, which is a relatively small species of shark that's very common on the coral reefs of the Indian and Pacific Ocean. And what he did was at the several sites around Morea, he would put food bait on the uh, bottom and he would see which sharks would turn up. He'd keep a record of which sharks would turn up. So he had certain sites around the atoll and he would do hundreds of dives, put this bait down, see which sharks would turn up. And the nice thing about black tip reef sharks is they have a beautiful coloration system. They're kind of golden colored, but if you look at their dorsal fin, it has a black and a white and then a gold region. And each shark actually has quite a distinctive pattern with the dorsal fin. So we can use what is called photo identification to identify individual sharks. It's kind of like a shark fingerprint. So that meant that he could identify the individuals that would turn up to the bait. And his basic idea was if two sharks turn up at the bait together, I'll assume they have some level of association with each other. The more often I see those two individuals turn up, the stronger that association. And so he did this repeatedly over several years, hundreds of dives, collected all this information on which sharks were arriving at the same time and was able to produce a social network. And this is what it looked like. This is what a shark society looks like. You can see that there are at least four social groups off of the, around the island of Morea. Each circle and square represents an individual shark. And you can see there's a blue group. Those individuals like to hang out with each other. There's a red group. Those individuals like to hang out with each other. A yellow group, a green group. There's very little sort of mixing of individuals between those different groups. But there are some exceptions. You can see, for example, there's a blue individual right in the center that seems to have connections with individuals from the other groups. So they do spend some time with individuals from the green group or the red group. And that means from a social network perspective, they could be quite important individuals because they are what we call very well connected within the network. So this was really one of the first studies to show that sharks can form social communities. However, there was a few issues with the methods used. First of all, it requires that the only time you see sharks is when you dive. So you're only seeing which sharks are arriving when you put bait in the water and you dive. And obviously there's only so much you can dive. So that's one limitation. Another issue is that you are attracting individuals to the bait, which means you don't know for sure that those individuals were coming to the bait together. They were just being uh, potentially being attracted to the bait. So we decided to modify the technique a little bit and use some electronic tags to try to do the same thing. And so we use a tool known as acoustic telemetry. And these are basically transmitters that go on the shark and they emit high frequency sound waves. That signal can then be detected by underwater listening stations that we put on the reef. And on the left there, you can see what one of the underwater listening stations look like, that black cylinder. So basically any time a shark with a transmitter swims within range of a listening station, that listening station records the time and the date when that animal was there. And each transmitter has a unique ID, so we know what the individual is. And these transmitters have battery lives of many years, so we can track the movements of these sharks over multiple years. We will then go every six months or every year and actually physically recover those receivers and download them and get all that data. So what we considered was, if two tag sharks have an association, then we should detect them arriving at a receiver and leaving a receiver at the same time. So they would, if they are traveling together, for example, they would arrive at one receiver at the same time, leave at the same time, be detected at another receiver at the same time, and so forth. So rather than using photo ID, 
we would track the movements of these tagged individuals over multiple years and use that to see how much time individuals were spending with each other. And again, the nice thing about this is that these receivers are recording the movements of these sharks year round. We're only there in the summer for a few weeks when we tag them, then we leave. But the receivers are recording continuously. So we don't have to be there, but we're still tracking their movements. So we did this uh, with gray reef sharks again at a small atoll in the central Pacific Ocean called Palmyra, which is very remote. It's a US fish and wildlife uh, refuge, so it's protected. Uh, and that means you have very large numbers of sharks. It's sort of your quintessential tropical paradise island with palm trees and blue lagoons and, and lots and lots of sharks. So we tagged over 40 gray reef sharks with transmitters that had battery lives of at least four years. They're much longer now, but back then they were only about four year battery lives and we tracked their movements. And so here you can see on the top left just shows you where Palmyra is. It's really in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the central Pacific. And on the right, you can see a map of the atoll. And so what we found was, first of all, somewhat surprisingly, sharks only used small regions of the atoll. So for example, some sharks just hung out on the west side of the atoll where you see the red circles. Other sharks just hung out in the north part of the atoll where you see the blue circles. This atoll is only 12 kilometers long. So a shark could easily do the length of that probably in a day. And yet year after year, they preferred to stay in certain regions of the atoll. Doesn't mean they never would go to other parts of the atoll, they would, but for very short periods of time. And so then we could build our social networks and we could do that for each year for four years. So you can see this going from 2011 to 2014. So each of those circles in this network is a species of shark or one individual shark, sorry, these are all gray sharks. And we've color coded it based on which region of the atoll you tend to find them. So a red circle means it's those sharks that use the red region, a blue circle, those sharks that use the blue region and so forth. And what I hope you can see is that the red individuals clump together, the blue individuals clump together, and that is repeated every year. The social network doesn't look exactly the same. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but every year you have that same general pattern of red individuals clumping together and blue individuals clumping together. What we showed is that they are forming social groups they're hanging out with each other and they don't mix much with other individuals from different groups. So red individuals do not really form social bonds with the blue individuals. doesn't mean they never encounter each other. They do sometimes cross paths, but how much time they spend with each other is no different than what you'd expect from chance alone. What's more, we could sometimes trace individuals that would form a bond that was lasting up to four years. Now, it may last longer than that. That was the battery life of the transmitter. So this shows not only is there social structure in these sharks, but it's also remarkably stable. Something similar to what you might see with bats, for example, or even some mammals. And we weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting to see this level of social stability, I should say, of individuals that like to spend time with each other. And those bonds can last sometimes for years. Now, the final case study I'll give is uh, one that really is more of an ongoing study. Now, the technique I just described works really well for sharks that spend lots of time close to the reef and spend their, really most of their time close to the reef because it requires you to detect these sharks on the receivers. And we have to detach the receivers to something. They're attached to the reef. So we're limited in that you only know where a shark is if you're detecting it on a receiver. What about sharks that may move over larger areas where it's difficult to track them? Well, to get around that, we're using a slightly modified version of that technique by putting on sharks what we call a business card tag. And a business card tag is almost like a miniaturized receiver that goes on a shark. So here you have your shark with uh, the yellow tag has a business card tag on it. The sharks with the red tags have the standard acoustic transmitters, just like I described before. So now that business card tag is detecting those other tag sharks. But now the business card is actually on one of the sharks. So it's traveling with the shark and telling us which other sharks is that shark hanging around with. So we call it a business card because it's almost like every time you meet somebody, they give you your business card and you put it in your pocket. And over time you have in your pocket, uh, account of all the business cards you've collected. And this allows us to look in the pocket and see what are those business cards? Who have you been hanging around with? Who have you been traveling with? And so this is a technique that we are using with white sharks uh, off of Mexico and Guadalupe. 
This is what our business card tag looks like. So what you have here is actually a combination of a few different sensors. There's a business card tag, which is the lower uh, part in yellow that is essentially detecting other tag sharks. But then on top of that, there's also sensors that tell us how fast the sharks are swimming. They measure acceleration, how deep they're going. And there's even a video camera so we can see what they're seeing. Now, we can't catch these sharks. These are big white sharks. So we have to put it onto their dorsal fin. And so my colleague, you see Fred Boyle here, he's uh, responsible, has put a lot of these tags on for us. Here you can see putting a tag on a great white. This is off Guadalupe Bay. You basically swim up to the shark and you clamp it on to the dorsal fin. And then five days later, it'll pop off and it'll float to the surface and we go and get it back. And so we've been using this to try to see if great whites perhaps hunt with other individuals. Do they hunt with other great whites? So again, Guadalupe Island, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with it, is it's about a 24 hour boat ride from San Diego or Ensenada. So it's off the Pacific uh, coast of Mexico, but it's a long way away. It's very, very remote. Uh, and it's a very sort of isolated location. And it's a natural aggregation site for great whites or white sharks, but it's also a very popular spot for ecotourism. So you can go out on the liverboards and you put cages in the water and you can see these white sharks. So we've been running this study out there now for a few years, and this is kind of preliminary, but this is what we're finding is that this is what a white shark social network looks like. So these sharks don't have the long-term social stability you see with reef sharks. But what we find is that they sometimes have very strong associations with other individuals, but they don't last long. So you may have two sharks that hang out with each other for almost 24 hours straight going everywhere together, and then they go their separate ways. So still having a social system, but very different from what you may see with the reef sharks. And the video cameras allow us to see what the sharks are seeing. So this is the camera on the dorsal fin of the shark. So this is our shark swimming around. It's on the bottom at Guadalupe, it's kind of murky. But you'll see our white shark turns and it sees another white shark. And so now it's starting to turn and it's starting to follow that other white shark. It's gonna become clearer now. So this is the sort of interaction we see between them. One shark sees another white shark and starts to follow it. So we don't know why for sure, but again, it could be, is this shark trying to see if the other shark is going towards where prey may be? Also think about the prey these animals take. They take big marine mammals like seals and sea lions, and that's a big meal. So if one shark takes a seal, or takes a sea lion, then another shark might be able to get some of the remains. That could still be enough to drive some level of a social association. I'm gonna hang around close to you just because if you get something to eat, I'm going to get some of it as well, and vice versa. It doesn't require us to work together. And so this just goes to show you the sort of depths that sharks will detect other sharks. So on the x-axis, just shows you how many sharks were detected by our sharks carrying the business card tags. And the y-axis is the depth at which they detect them at. And although our sharks will frequently dive to 300 meters, that's 900 feet or more, um, they would only really detect other tag sharks shallower than 100 meters, about 300 feet. So perhaps to form their associations, they require vision, uh, which requires clear water and below 100 meters, it's just too dark. I don't know, but there seems to be this definite cutoff of they only spend time with each other below 100 meters. The cameras also allow us to reveal something about the hunting of these white sharks. So now our shark you can see it going up into the shallows. So it's only about 30 feet deep. This is in Guadalupe, but it's going to shortly see a seal or a sea lion, I can't remember which. And you're gonna see it in a moment. There it is, it's coming into frame. So our shark has seen it, it's gonna turn. So it sees it. Now it's gonna turn up towards it again. It's gonna try and go up into it, into the shallows. And you'll see that our little marine mammal does not seem concerned at all. It's basically just dancing loops around the shark at this point. Now, again, one thing that may stands out about Guadalupe is the water is very clear. And so that makes it hard for a white shark to ambush its prey. They really require ambush. We see that once the prey becomes aware of the shark, the sharks have a hard time actually succeeding. So now a shark is, uh, this is another shark, but it's up by the shallows. It's, it's in deeper water, but closer to the surface. And you're gonna see it approaching a turtle. So soon, again, the camera's on the shark, there's our turtle. So the shark is going to start homing on the turtle, turtle swimming away. Now, keep in mind that behind this camera, there's a 15 or 16 foot great white. So you can imagine the shock that this turtle is about to get when it, when it turns around and realizes what is coming up behind it. The shark's going right up to the turtle, but 
as you'll see in a moment, it turns right in, turns right in, and then the turtle realizes, turns its shell and invades. And again, once the shark realizes it's been seen, it, it gives up. So this just shows you that even for a big white shark, getting your prey is not easy. They really seem to require to have uh, the ability to ambush their prey. And that's difficult in a place where the water is very clear. So this may be something that it is really beneficial to be able to hunt with other white sharks, because again, individual foraging, foraging success may be quite low in this environment. So I'll just end with, are sh sharks social? Well, some are. So we can see now that it's certainly in some species, they do have a social system. They do like to form social groups, but it can vary. In reef sharks, it may be these social groups with lots of individuals and long-term social stability. In other sharks like white sharks, it may be strong social associations that only last a short period of time. I haven't mentioned some of the species of sharks that are not social. Oceanic white tip sharks, great hammerheads, we hardly ever see them in groups. So they may be truly social, uh, solitary sharks. Now, presumably when they go through mating as well, they have some level of social associations, but overall they're a pretty solitary species. So we still don't understand why are they social? Is it related to hunting? Is it related to defense? Is it related to mating? Or in some species, it could be all of those. So I called my talk, The Secret Social Lives of Sharks. And it's not because they were trying to keep it a secret. It's more the fact that until recently, we didn't have the technology or the analytical skills. That's really been one of our big advancements has been improvements in the maths and the, and the analytical skills to see these social patterns. They were of course always there, but we couldn't see them. So I'll end with that. I'd just like to list uh, some of my colleagues who've helped me with this work and the work I presented. And of course, also some of the, the funders that have funded some of that research. And again, I thank you for uh, joining me. I'll be happy to take any questions. So, um, to everyone out there, if you have questions for Yanni, can you please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat? Um, it's easiest, easier for us to uh, track the questions when they're in that Q&A feature. Um, if you've already typed in the chat, just go ahead and try to copy and paste and put them in that q and that would be very helpful. Um, but I do see the chat coming in. Yanni, everyone's saying great job. Thank you. They loved it. Um, but as as the questions are coming in, um, can you can you elaborate um, about the business card? How how do you retrieve the data when it's mm -hmm. on the shark? So we have to physically recover it. Ah. It doesn't it doesn't transmit anything. It's yeah. too much data to transmit. So what happens is it has a uh, galvanic release so that everything after five days or 10 days, depending on what sort of link I put, the whole thing releases and floats to the surface. Ah, okay. And then embedded in there is actually a radio transmitter that we use that to go and find the tag floating in the ocean and get it back. So if we don't physically get it back, we get nothing, we lose everything. Right, so kind of risky, but you get a high reward, I guess. So yeah, you don't have it's to- beautiful when you get it, but not, not when you lose it. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Um, and then let's see, as there's more coming in, I had one more question. Um, how the heck did you get that camera on that white shark? Well, you know, there, um, so Guadalupe Island, first of all, I'll say is, is diving outside of the cage is illegal. So we have special permits to do so. Uh, and you just, you have to be very, very careful. Um, it's not like diving with other sharks. And so everyone there is, is very experienced. Um, and you just got to rate for be in the water with the right sharks. And I mean that some sharks are a little bit temperamental and those are not animals you want to be in the water with. Um, but most of them are not. Most of them are actually quite calm. And the main thing is to have plenty of people in the water so you can basically keep an eye in all directions. The, the most dangerous thing is a shark you don't see. So you have to make sure that all kind of corners are covered so that whoever's tagging the shark doesn't have to worry there's another one coming up behind it. That's why we have, we have multiple people in the water to, to keep an eye on them. And how often when you get the camera on, are you like, oh, it's not facing the right way or, you know, like that oh, one. That, that's, I mean, the biggest problem is that when the tag goes on, sometimes it clips just as the shark is moving away. And so the tag ends up pointing up towards the surface. Yeah. So in some cases, the shark has actually come back and someone has swum down and pushed it down. So it's on right. In other cases, nothing you can do. So I have a few camera deployments where the camera's pointing up upwards. So you're not seeing what's in front of the shark, you're seeing what's above it, but that's the way it goes. You don't have too much leeway with, with animals this big. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's get to some of the um, audience watching. Okay. Evie has a question. Um, when white sharks follow each other, did you ever see aggression from the shark being followed? Potentially the one that follows could take prey from the one that is being followed. That's a, that's a great point. We never saw it on the videos, but you do see aggression between sharks at the bait when they have the cages in the water. So when you have bait in the water and you have sharks approaching, they're, bringing the, they're using the bait to get the sharks closer to the cages you will sometimes see aggression there. And it's almost always from larger sharks towards smaller sharks. So some of the really big sharks will sometimes basically let the smaller ones know, I am I get first sort of choice here. So you do have this complexity of uh, associations being beneficial, but I said at the beginning, there's also gonna be competition. And this is not a case of, as far as we know, cooperation. So there is a sort of complexity of dominance, for example, and if one shark is more dominant than the other, does it want another individual there? And those are all questions we, we don't know. So I don't even know for sure that that is driving the association. That's kind of the best guess we have based on what we see, but there, there could be something else, who knows? Okay, uh, Chris Chabot, hi Chris. Uh, awesome talk, Yanni. Have any data on the relatedness of the sharks that are forming social networks? Uh, it's a great question. So for example, in a lot of mammal social groups, one of the uh, aspects that uh, determines who hangs out with whom is relatedness. You tend to have uh, hang out with relatives. So in sharks, there's only been one study that has actually looked at that, and that was the black tip reef shark study. So they actually did get tissue samples from those individuals as well. And they could use that to see how closely related the individuals were. And basically kinship had uh, relatedness had no influence on the social group. So who was in the social group had nothing to do with who's related to whom. Now, doesn't mean that relatedness couldn't be important for other shark species. That's the only study that has looked at it, but that one found uh, no effect. Okay. Ah, Yanni, our friend, Christy Forsgren. Um, hi, Christy. Hi, Christy. Um, has there been research on self-recognition of conspecifics? The white shark study indicates they have this ability. Yeah, so that's another thing that, you know, is kind of um, unknown, but especially with the gray reef sharks, you know, where you have the same individuals associating over multiple years, um, suggests some level of recognition, you know, and, and I don't know what that's going to be, whether it's chemical or visual, but um, you know, somehow they have to be able to recognize other individuals. So I think that's going to be a, a fairly hot topic, not just with sharks, but with other animals as well, is you know, exactly how well are they able to recognize other individuals. Okay, um, Jolinda wants to know, um, where was the big rock in the middle of the ocean and what was its name? That was Roca Batida is the name of the place, and it's part of the Socorro Islands, the Revillejigedo Archipelago. So it's it's off of Mexico, off of, uh, again, it's about a 23-hour boat ride from Cabo, San Jose, uh, off of Mexico. And it's a series of islands. Of Ro Roca Batida is the smallest one. It literally is just a rock. Uh, it would take you about 15 minutes to swim around. One of my, one of my favorite dive sites, just spectacular. Jessica wants to know which which shark social interaction do you find most interesting? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, to me, still, it's the hammerhead schools. And it's frustrating that I know so little or we know so little about it and really what's driving it. But it's just such a sight to see. And it's just one of those. It's not a very scientific answer, but there's just something going on there, and I just want to know what it is. <laughs> so I, I don't understand what the social dynamics of those groups are with those hammerheads, but it, there's got to be something. So I think that that to me is the is the one that fascinates me the most. Okay. Um, Kay asks, how do you interpret what the shark is thinking or doing, i.e., chasing a prey? Is it collected evidence or do you use intuition to put words to the actions of the shark? Um, a lot of the time, you know, you don't have a solid answer. So it's best guess. You try to come up with an explanation. 
And it's really hard with sharks. When you're working with smaller animals, you can do like, let's say lab experiments and you can control conditions and use the experiment to try to rule out other alternatives, which you can't do in a field setting. When you have 300 sharks hunting at night, you can't experimentally do anything. So we try and use a combination of new tools to try and rule out other factors. We actually use mathematical models a lot, and those don't really give you an answer. They give you a potential answer. They say, well, it could be this. This could explain it, but doesn't necessarily mean it does explain it. So that's why a lot of those I put question marks there, that this is our best interpretation, but um, we could be wrong. It could be something else. Okay, um, a follow-up from Kay. What happens if you lose the data? Uh, I, lose a, I lose a lot of money and I get very sad. So <laughs> I, try, I try not to let that happen, but it does happen. Uh, we've lost tags, we've lost receivers. I mean, the, the first trip I did to Fakarava, um, I think every, almost every single deployment failed except for one. The next year was very successful, but the first one was just not. And it was, um, it was, you know, tough to deal with, but you just got to figure out what went wrong and give it another shot. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly is a problem. And, and we don't always talk about the failures in the field because often we don't have any data to show for it. So no one hears about them, but there's a long list of, of field trips and expeditions that have led to nothing because they failed. Yeah, that's a good point. That's typically not talked about. <laughs> um, Jonathan wants to know, do sharks ever turn on those who they are social with? That I don't know. Um, but we do know that, that for many species, again, there will be a dominance hierarchy. And that means a, a sort of a pecking order in terms of which individuals are going to have first access to food and often that is uh, size related. So larger individuals will have greater access than smaller ones. But what was really interesting actually was a recent study with Pacific lemon sharks off of French Polynesia again. And there they saw that the dominance hierarchy between lemon sharks wasn't related necessarily to size. But what was interesting was that sharks could observe what other sharks were doing. So for example, let's say one shark was dominant one day then another shark from outside came out and for whatever reason, it was able to best the dominant shark. Now, I'm not saying they had a fight. It just meant that for whatever reason, the, the previously dominant shark gave way to this new shark. The previously dominant shark now lost its status with the other sharks in the group, which suggests, again, they were able to observe, recognize that that individual that was once dominant now wasn't. And so it was now no longer dominant the next few days. So again, it just shows you there's, there's a complexity there which you, you wouldn't necessarily have considered for, for a fish um, and a lot we don't know about it. Okay, Megan says, what an awesome and interesting presentation. I was just talking with my dad and he indeed mentioned about Guadalupe Island and how sharks are very attracted to it. Very cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, Guadalupe is is definitely it's naturally a aggregation site for the sharks. They're not there because of the ecotourism. The ecotourism is taking advantage of them being there. So you know, again, we don't even fully understand why uh, they they aggregate there. You know, most likely there's also mating going on there. So that would be a good explanation as to why they are uh, turning up at the island. Chuck wants to know, have you worked with or handled any young of the year white sharks? I actually won. And that was the very first one we satellite tagged when I was a graduate student at uh, Long Beach State. So that would have been back in 2000. And that was the only one I've ever, I've ever handled was that one juvenile white shark that was caught and uh, brought to SCMI just, just down the road. And we actually kept it in a tank to get it strong enough to swim for three days in a, one of the big tanks and then put a satellite tag on it and released it. And that was the first satellite track of a, of a juvenile white shark. I think I remember that. So, yeah. Uh, okay, Mary asks, what time of year are the hammerheads congregating in those large numbers? There, is there ecotourism there? And um, 
the public see, oh, can the public see these sharks without diving? Uh, there is ecotourism, so all of these sites are quite remote, so you have to take generally liverboard boats, so to get to Wolf Island it's a 30 hour boat ride, so you go on a liverboat and you, you live on it for three, four days. Um, they don't really do any non scuba because the conditions there is, is pretty rough, very strong currents, so it's actually would be very dangerous for, for free divers. So really, I, I don't know of any operation that takes out free divers, it's, it's almost all scuba based. Um, with the hammerheads, they're actually, you can find them there most of the year. There's actually a, only a few months that's bad, and it depends on which place you're going. In Galapagos, for example, uh, April, May is not very good, but the other months can be pretty good. But there's definitely some months that are better than others. So like September, October is, is amazing. Um, okay, I'm just writing down a couple notes of a few things that I wanted to ask. Can you... Um, can you explain to the audience a little bit uh, the difference between um, diving in the open ocean like that or on a reef, the, how, how different that is? Between open ocean, blue water, you mean? Or, yes. Yeah. yeah, so the, the, uh, the challenge with diving in open ocean, in blue water, is that you have no frame of reference, and especially because the water visibility is very good in open ocean, so everything just looks blue. So you could end up at 100 feet, potentially 200 feet, and not realize it. And so it's very easy to lose your frame of reference and understand what your depth is. That's not a problem on a reef, because generally you're on, you're on the bottom, or you're close to the bottom. So you can obviously tell if you're going out into deeper water, because you stop seeing the bottom. So in open ocean, you have to be a lot more uh, cautious with your depth. Obviously, there can be very strong currents and you won't realize it. Again, if there's a very strong current on a reef, you know, because you can see relative to the reef, you're moving. But in open ocean, you can't tell that you're moving. <laughs> so uh, you may be in a very strong current and you're being carried away and you, would, you wouldn't realize it. So there's a few different things you have to do um, to dive safely if you're in open ocean. Okay, a few more have come in. Um, Ara says, great talk. Um, are you aware of any evidence to suggest that sharks are able to communicate with each other to any extent? Um, they could, again, we, we you know they likely do have body language that can be, I guess, some form of basic communication from shark to shark, but that's really the only um, example I could give. I don't really, can't think of really any other communication other than technically perhaps chemical communication in the sense that we do believe, for example, when you saw that pre-mating behavior, likely uh, the females are producing pheromones, which is a signal, and the males are, are detecting those pheromones. Um, but from a standard sort of shark to shark interaction, likely some form of body language will be there, but how common that is or, you know, how, um, detailed that is, I don't, I don't know. Okay, someone anonymous is asking if the hammerheads near Palm Beach and Jupiter can be seen from land or a short boat trip? Um, yeah, you can see that. I mean, you can often see the black tips from the beach off of Palm Beach. Um, and you can definitely see them with uh, drones. So drones have really improved our abilities when what we see now it, it's amazing you know and that was always probably going on we just didn't see it from the air um, but the drones really reveal so much um finally those sharks are actually very very shy so although you can see thousands of black tips some of them right up by the beach if you try and get in the water with them you won't see anything because they just they they are extremely shy and cautious and so they all disappear um and then the great hammerheads aren't as abundant, but you can see, you know, quite regularly see great hammerheads cruising, cruising down the beach, looking for black dips. And, and a follow-up, is there any specific time of year for the sharks in Palm Beach? Yeah, so it normally starts about February to April. Okay. So they migrate down here. So when it gets really cold up north in the winter, they migrate down as far as, far south as about uh, South Florida. And then by the end of the spring, when it's warming up, they start heading uh, north again. Um, I'm wondering, Yanni, if you will talk a little bit more about um, the kind of fingerprint on the black tips. Mm -hmm. 
Is there any other shark that has something like that where you can distinguish individuals? Yeah, so photo ID, I don't actually do any myself, but photo ID has been done with white sharks based on the shape of the dorsal fin, particularly the trailing edge of the dorsal fin has sort of series of notches and things like that. And that can be quite distinctive uh, for each individual. It's also been used based on spot patterns. So for example, sand tiger sharks, they've used that. Whale sharks, because each individual will have their own distinctive uh, spot patterns. So some of the methods you have to be careful with. Uh, so for example, spots can change somewhat perhaps as the animal grows. For example, the distance between the spots might change. When you look at things like notches and wounds on the dorsal fin, that you have to be careful with because of course something could happen and you could get new notches and therefore you know misidentify your individual. Um, but it's been done with several species, white tip reef sharks, uh, sand tigers, whale sharks, white sharks, uh, and probably several other ones as well. So cool. Um, okay, so uh, let's just close it with this then. Um, can you give some advice to any of our young scientists out there that are lis listening and watching? Um, any advice if they're interested in becoming a, a shark biologist or a field biologist? Any advice? Yeah, I think one of the things I would recommend is to always think broadly. I know it's it's uh, it's you may want to specialize immediately on sharks and just focus everything on sharks, but ultimately to have the best uh, chance of, of getting into that career, you have to have quite a broad uh, sort of education. What I mean by that, for example, is having really good math skills, having really good statistics skills, having good computer skills, things that you may not initially think would be useful. Those are actually the skills that are really hard to acquire being, you know, having good skills in physics. Again, it's something I didn't really think would be useful to me, you know, when I was in, in high school, but those are the skills that are, that are really useful. So it's not just being able to dive, for example. In fact, being able to dive is really not a requirement. It can help for some things, but you certainly don't need to be a diver or a good diver to have a career studying sharks, but you do need to be able to do statistics. You need to understand your math. So those are going to be more critical skills, perhaps, especially at the early uh, stage than necessarily having extensive field skills. Obviously, field skills are good as well, but uh, make sure you uh, keep up and, and get a good basis on your, on your math, statistics, computers, things like that. Good advice. Okay, um, so we're gonna we're gonna end it there. Um, we would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Yanni Papastamatiu. Thanks again to friends of Cabrera Aquarium and the City of Los Angeles for their support. And once again, our upcoming online lecture will be Friday, December third, and our speaker is Dr. Mara Hart from Ocean Inc. The title of her talk will be Sex in the Sea, The Weird and Wonderful Ways Animals Reproduce in the Ocean and Why That Matters. More information can be found on Cabrera and Aquarium's website. And a reminder, we have recorded this lecture and we will post it on our website soon. So thanks again for joining us. Stay safe and hope to see you next time and good night.